good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Ransom Church. It's wonderful to see you here today. My name is Phil Wiseman, and I am the creative arts pastor here at the Ransom Church. And every so often, Phil Tag lets other people preach, and I always love the opportunity to preach. And so here I am today, and, and today we're starting a new series uh, called Anatomy, What We're Made Of. And we're talking about the things that make the Ransom Church who we are. What are the things that drive us? What are the things that we as a church community would die for? Another word for this might be our core values. And if you've been, if you've been coming to the Ransom for any time at all, you've probably heard us say these. In fact, you probably know them by heart. But just in case you're new, our core values here at the Ransom are that we want to worship free of inhibition, live free of sin, and serve free of self. And so every single thing that we do as a church flows into one of those core values, if not all three of them. And so I get to talk about worshiping free of inhibition today. But first, I want to start off by telling you this. My wife and I, were fairly new parents. We have a daughter named Bella who's just over two years old. And so that means that we have recently been introduced to the bizarre world of children's television. <laughs> and let me tell you, if you're a parent, you know exactly what I mean by the word bizarre. There's some weird stuff on there, guys. It's like you watch it and you're thinking, man, what kind of burrito did that guy have to eat the night before to think of this? This is just weird. But there's, but there's one show that, that kind of jumped out at me. Um, and actually, I kind of like it. It's kind of a neat show. It's called Super Why. Any parents know Super Why? Okay, Bella really likes it. It, like, teaches your kids how to read and stuff. So, I mean, that's not all bad, right? It teaches them about reading and spelling and that sort of thing. And so here's the premise of the show. The characters of the show actually journey into books. Like, I think they literally get on a spaceship and fly into books. And in the book, they're like interacting with the characters and that sort of thing. And these books are classic children's stories. But the premise is that early in the episode, they encounter some sort of a problem that they have to solve. And so they look to a book in order to solve the problem. That's a good lesson to learn. You get smarter when you read. And so that's great that our kids are learning about that. And so they fly into the story. But here's the catch. In order to solve the problem, they change the story. Now, mind you, these are like classic children's stories. And so at first, I'm like, wait a second, you can't just go changing these stories. I mean, what are we teaching our kids here? That truth is relative, that they can just change truth and bend it to their will all that they want? What are we supposed to be saying here? I mean, you can let your mind go down all sorts of rabbit trails if you want. But then I realized one day that when it comes to worship, changing the story is exactly what worship is all about. Changing the story is exactly what worship is all about. In fact, when we worship, we acknowledge the fact that stories can change. You see, most people, I believe, are essentially surrendered to their situation in life. Most people think, you know, my past essentially sets the pattern for my future. So, so if I've been a screw-up in the past, then that probably means I'll be a screw-up in the future as well, according to their thinking. If I've messed up in the past, I'll probably be a mess up in the future. If I've, if I've been an outcast, if I've been broken, if I've been made fun of, if I've been left out in the past, this is probably the pattern that I'm going to continue to be on into the future. But listen, when we worship, that is where we stand together in the presence of God and we hear God say, no, no, you are not just the sum of your past. You are not trapped within a hopeless story. We are part of a greater story than our own. Our story is actually part of God's story. And when we realize this, it changes everything. There's a story in the Bible that takes place at a well. In fact, there's a lot of stories in the Bible that take place at a well. It seems like wells are a recurring theme throughout the Bible. This isn't too surprising because most of the Bible takes place in dry, arid regions, in the desert. And so a well is obviously a source of water, but it's also a source of life. But it's interesting, as you read through the Bible, every time a well is mentioned, it's like God's story unfolds a little bit more. And so you read these stories and you start to realize that each person in the story is playing a role in God's plan. Each moment at the well, God's story is unfolding a little more, sometimes in very, very unexpected ways. For instance, Isaac. Isaac's wife comes to him at a well. Now, Isaac's not there. A servant is. But nonetheless, the meeting happens at a well. Isaac gets married and they have a child and they name him Jacob. And then Jacob grows up and meets his wife at a well. They get married, they have a child, they name him Joseph. Joseph gets thrown in a well by his brothers. Uh, but then out of the well, he gets sold into slavery in Egypt. But then 
Joseph does not stay in slavery. He actually rises out of slavery and by the, act, by, by the hand of God becomes Pharaoh's right-hand man. He's like in charge of the whole kingdom. And as a result, he can save his family and his people from a famine. Hundreds of years later, Joseph's descendants are still in the land of Egypt, but now they're slaves. They're called the Israelites or the Jews. And there's one Jewish man named Moses. And Moses had a little bit different story because Moses actually is raised within Pharaoh's household. He's not a slave. He's actually royalty. But one day Moses kills a man and he's running for his life out of Egypt. And he finds himself in a desert and he makes his way to a well. And at that well, he meets a woman named Zipporah. They get married and they have a son and they name their son Gershom. And Gershom sounds like the Hebrew word for I've become a foreigner. You see, it's at that well where Moses first feels homesick. And how appropriate because this is the man that God would use to lead his people home to the promised land. So unexpected things happen at the well. And stories take a left turn there. And in the stories that I just shared, you have a liar and a thief. You have an arrogant little boy. You have a fugitive and a murderer who all step out of their stories and into God's story at a well. Which means that when Jesus walks up to a well in John chapter 4 verse 6, you can be pretty sure that you should pay attention. Because something big is about to go down. And all Jesus did was ask the woman for a drink. All he did was ask her for a drink, but that's all it took for this woman to know that this guy must be nuts. This guy has to be crazy. And she says, Jesus, don't don't you understand what's going on here? I'm a Samaritan woman. You're a Jewish man. Jewish men do not speak to Samaritan women. Don't you know the story, Jesus? Don't you know the history? Jewish people and Samaritan people don't, don't even speak to each other, let alone speak to each other. They don't even cross paths. In fact, the fact that you're even in this village right now, this Samaritan village, proves to me that you must be nuts because you shouldn't even be within 100 miles of this place. You see, the Jews and the Samaritans had some bad blood, to say the least. In fact, just two decades before this meeting occurred, some Samaritans had snuck into the Jewish temple and littered human bones throughout the courtyard thus defiling, utterly defiling the most sacred and holy place that the Jews had. And and this is just one example of a battle that had been raging for centuries. And so by the time of Christ, the Jews, they saw the Samaritans as half-breeds. They didn't even see them as fully human. And Samaritans saw Jews the same way. Okay? And not only is she a Samaritan, but she's a woman. Now, ladies, let me qualify that for a second. Okay? Okay? In the ancient times, women were very oppressed. You can be kind of glad that you were born in this day and age. And I realize that that things aren't completely equal in our world either. I mean, as a white, middle-class male, I have certain unfair advantages that aren't right. But nonetheless, you can be glad that you were born now and not then because in the time of Christ, in the ancient times, women were very, very oppressed. In fact, listen to what one ancient Jewish smart person, I'm not going to call him a wise man because then it's associated with me a little bit. But anyway, listen to what he wrote. He said, He that talks much with womankind brings evil upon himself and neglects the study of the law and at the last will inherit hell. Not terribly flattering, is it, ladies? So on behalf of my gender, I just want to stand here and take a moment and say, Ladies, I'm sorry for centuries of being idiots. (laughs) But there is a bright side to this. You may have been oppressed for millennia, but at least you weren't morons. I mean, you can be happy about that. So go tell your friends. Phil says, I'm sorry. Hopefully it makes it all better. But here's the story. Isn't it amazing how much we let our past dictate the present? Isn't it amazing how much we let the past dictate the present? This woman, she's saying, Jesus, don't you know the story? You're a man. I'm a woman. You're a Jew. And I'm a Samaritan. Jewish men don't talk to Samaritan women. It's how it's always been. And in the same way, sometimes I find myself thinking, Jesus, don't you know the failure that I've been? Don't you know all my mess-ups, all my screw-ups, all my mistakes, all my sins? And pretty soon it's easy for me and probably for you to just surrender to this reality and just think, who am I to change it? This is just the way it is, and I can't help it. So maybe you're letting your past dictate your future. It could be something that you've done, but it could also be something that's been done to you. And it has a hold over you. And you can't let it go. And just like this woman, you don't think that you can associate with Jesus. Because you're letting your past dictate your future. And so you think you know how the story 
is supposed to end. But listen, when we worship, we encounter the God who changes stories. When we worship, we encounter the God who changes stories. We realize that we're part of a much bigger drama than we first realized. And this is a drama where God is the main character, not us. And so when we worship, our story gets caught up in his story, and we realize that God is so much bigger than our past mistakes. And so we can say things like, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Because when we worship, we encounter the God who changes stories. And that's exactly what happens to this woman at the well. You see, she thought she knew how the story was supposed to go. But little does she realize that she's actually part of something much bigger than herself. And she's about to find that out. You see, Jesus takes the focus off of her and puts it on him. In verse 10, he says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Let me read that again. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Okay, imagine this scene. A strange man walks up to the well, and he breaks every cultural taboo and rule in the book. And then he's got the audacity to say, you know what, if you knew who I was. It would have been you breaking the rules. I mean, how arrogant is that? If you had any idea who I was, you would have been the one breaking all the rules. Now listen, if Jewish men don't talk to Samaritan women, you can believe that Samaritan women certainly don't talk to Jewish men. And yet that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if you only knew this water that I could give you, if you could only taste what I have for you, you wouldn't care about the past. You wouldn't care about the rules. You wouldn't care about the religious barriers. You wouldn't care about your past mistakes. You would only care about one thing. You would only care about drinking this living water that I can give you. You see, in the ancient times, they had what were called cisterns. A cistern is like this giant cauldron in the ground that they would collect rainwater with or they'd put water in it, and that's how they stored their water. But the problem was that after a while, the water would stagnate, and sometimes the cisterns would crack. Or even worse, a dead animal would, well, it wouldn't be dead when it fell in. It would be alive, and then it would die in the water. And it just the, the water would be nasty and disgusting. But occasionally, if you were lucky, you would discover an underground spring. And, and then the water would continually bubble up to the surface and it would be always fresh and always clean and always cold. And the ancients called this living water because it was always new. And so this woman, in her mind, she naturally goes there, of course. She thinks, oh, Jesus, he's talking about H2O. Hey, tell me where this living water is because then I won't have to come back to this stupid well all the time. Tell me where this living water is and then I'll, I won't be thirsty anymore. But that's when Jesus puts his finger on the real issue. And as you read the story in John 4, it kind of feels like Jesus is going out in the left field here, taking a weird turn in the conversation. They're talking about water, and then he says this. He says, go get your husband. Go get your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right, you have five. And the one that you're with right now isn't even your husband. You see, there's a reason, he says. There's a reason why you came to this well in the middle of the day, in the hottest part of the day, when there's nobody else around. And that reason is that your cisterns are cracking. Your wells are running dry. And it has been so long since you have had something good to drink. It has been so long since you have drank deeply from a well. And Jesus says, I am that well. I am the living water. And see, all throughout Scripture, stories change at a well. And when we gather in worship, listen, when we gather in worship, the well that we gather around is Jesus Christ. You see, we gather at a well when we worship, and we taste the living water that never runs dry. And so we understand now what the psalmist meant when he says, all my fountains are in you. And we corporately proclaim truths about God. And as we sing about his great deeds, as we shout praises to him, all the lies and all the deceit and all the insecurities that we carry within are replaced by his great truth about his love and his mercy, his greatness and his forgiveness. But so often we forget what's really happening. And just like this woman thinks that he's offering free indoor plumbing, right? So we roll into worship kind of half awake, 
We don't even prepare. We kind of go through the motions. We sip our drinks. We, we shake hands with the person next to us. Then we start clapping and we think, oh man, Phil's making us clap on beat again. Uh, I hope this ends soon. This is awkward. I'm from South Dakota. I don't do this. This isn't me. Oh good, it's over. Thank you, Jesus. And so we forget what worship is all about. Worship's not about making us comfortable. It's not about making us feel good. It's about all of us together throwing ourselves into God's story and being transformed by it. And so we can sing things like, you are good, you are good, when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. Or we can say things like, we are free, he died and lives again. We will be a people free from sin. And so we realize in worship that our stories, because of the great God that we sing to, our stories can change. I may be broken, but our God is greater, stronger, and higher than any other. So the bottom line is this. When we come to worship, we encounter the truth of who God is, and therefore we discover the truth of who we are in him. When we worship, we encounter the truth of who God is, and therefore we discover the truth of who we are in him. Now Jesus continues speaking to this woman at the well. And even after Jesus puts his finger on her brokenness, she's still hung up on the religious differences between them. She says, you know, you guys worship at the temple in Jerusalem. My people, we worship here on this mountain. And so Jesus has to bring it back around and he says to her, and I think that he says this to us as well. He says, listen, you are so worried about your religious traditions about the past about the rules about your mistakes about your wounds but listen none of that matters because there is a time coming where you will worship neither on the mountain nor in Jerusalem and he says this he says there is a time coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth he says a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and And in truth, the time is coming and has now come. Okay, I think Jesus is essentially saying this. He's saying, listen, there is a reality parallel to this one. And that reality is, in fact, much more real than anything you can touch or taste or see or smell or hear. And this reality, through Jesus, is breaking into ours. And listen, when we worship We don't just proclaim this reality. We don't just sing of it. We actually experience it. We actually embody it. We actually taste it. You see, there are so many things we concern ourselves with, so-called real life, the things about buying and selling and working and playing and trading, all of these things that we think are so real. But I think Jesus here is saying, listen, there is in fact a realer reality. And when we worship, we taste it. It is this place where God's will is done, this place that we might call the kingdom of God, this place where the world becomes as God originally envisioned it. And when we worship, we sing of it, and we also taste it. Now, I can tell I'm getting a little bit abstract, so I just want to hit the pause button for a second, and maybe it'll help you to watch this movie clip, kind of a classic movie clip that might explain a little bit what I'm talking about here. Go ahead and take a look. Now, that movie, of course, is The Matrix, and uh, it raises many deep, profound, philosophical questions about life, not the, least of being, not the least of which being, why is that man wearing sunglasses at night in a thunderstorm? <laughs> I mean, what does it mean? What do they symbolize? It's so deep. And hopefully, in some small, maybe silly way, this helps you understand what's going on. It's not a perfect analogy, because while what we're saying here is that the things that we touch and see in and hear and smell. These things are, are not necessarily all there is to reality. In the same way, Neo has to realize that fact. But the truth is that the fuller, the deeper sense of reality for Neo was not very pleasant. However, for us, what we're saying is that there is a place where God's will is done. It's called the kingdom of God. And when we worship, we actually embrace it and we recognize it as real. Let me give you an example. When we arrive at eternity shore. Where death is just a memory and tears are no more. That sounds like a fairy tale, doesn't it? But the Bible says, sin has lost its power, 
death has lost its sting. And so when we sing these words, death is just a memory and tears are no more, it may not sound like anything that's remotely real, but in, tr- in truth, it actually is realer than the things that we concern ourselves with. Here's another example. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. It sounds like a fairy tale too, doesn't it? But you know it's actually realer than the air that you breathe. The fact that there's a God and there are armies of angels. And he leads them and he is with you. It's hard to believe, but it's true. And when we worship, we come to grips with that fact. We come to grips with the fact that there's a God who changes stories, who's bringing a new reality to this place. And so here's the deal, guys. As a worship leader, I simply want you to realize that we are encountering a reality much bigger than what we ever thought. And we are encountering a God who is much bigger than our past mistakes. We are encountering a God who can change stories. So as you came in today, there was a, a red pill on your chair. Full disclosure, it's actually a hot tamale. Fierce cinnamon flavor. But you see, in the movie The Matrix, Neo had to make a choice. He had to make a choice. Do I want to go on, just experience what I know, what's comfortable, what I'm familiar with? Or do I want to know the truth? the time is coming and has now come the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth and so here's the deal as a worship leader all I'm doing is I'm leading you to the well but I can't make you drink that's a decision you have to make and so I just want to invite you to take the pill I want to invite you to dive in with both feet and once you do that would you stand with us because we're going to continue to do the thing that we've been talking about for the last 25 minutes. We're going to worship our God and our King.